to have those of you that are visiting with us. I uh, had a chance to shake hands with a few people. You young ladies back there in the back with Miss Christie, it's good to have you with us. Thank you for being in the service today as well. As I said at the beginning of the service, today is going to be a little bit different uh, than our usual services, and that's not a bad thing. Sometimes doing things a little bit different is okay when God's in it. It's obviously okay. And today we're going to be doing that. Uh, we're going to be uh, watching a few videos. I'm also going to be... Uh, uh, bringing uh, out some of the truths that we find in the Word of God as well. Uh, but the reason that we've kind of changed things up today is because today is the International Day of Prayer for the persecuted church. Every year in November, either the first or the second Sunday in that November for the last several years, uh, there has been a concerted push uh, by ministries and churches uh, that uh, are actively involved in helping those who are persecuted around the world and trying to raise that awareness of what's going on to help believers know better, number one, how to pray, and then number two, also, uh, to have a better understanding of maybe how we as individual Christians or we as a church can help, uh, even this morning in the Sunday school hour. Um, I was sharing with the Sunday school class, one of the ministries that we'll be talking about here in just a few minutes, Voice of the Martyrs, actually has a, a kit that uh, you can purchase uh, that allows a missionary, or not a missionary, but somebody who is on the front lines of some of these countries where persecution is so hot and, and the danger is so real. Uh, that it gives them an opportunity, it sends them supplies that they need to reach villages, to reach villagers, um, whether it's Bibles and, uh, and tracts and, and, and uh, outreach tools to DVRs or DVD players, excuse me, DVD players and, and DVDs so that they can share in a larger setting to help people who maybe never have heard the gospel exactly who Jesus Christ is and what he's done for us. But in doing that, it puts them at great risk. And so anything we can do to help, so our Sunday school class is uh, looking to help uh, actually support uh, uh, somebody by sending them one of those kits uh, to allow them to do that. And so there's a lot of different ways you can help. So part of my burden for today is to do two things. One is to let us as a church see what's going on around the world and why it's so important that we pray for our brothers and sisters who are going through this, but also uh, to kind of raise awareness about the ministries that are out there in case you want to get more involved. Uh, it can be anything from writing letters to a Christian who's imprisoned to, like I said, financial support, sending Bibles into countries where it's illegal to even have a Bible or to try to get them in. I've done that, uh, and as I was telling them in the Sunday school class years ago from Voice of the Martyrs, and, and Miss Teresa will remember this one as well, uh, we uh, uh, actually uh, created or we got the materials from Voice of the Martyrs and we made a, a, a parachutes. And uh, we put the strings in them, ran the, uh, the grommets, did all of that kind of stuff. And then it came with a plastic Ziploc bag, pretty good-sized little bag. And we mailed those back to VOM. They put a Bible and a radio that was uh, tied, hard tied to a particular Christian radio station so they could hear the gospel. And then they would fly planes over Columbia into these regions you couldn't get into because of the drug wars and all of those kind of things. And they would drop those parachutes out of the airplanes into these villages and all of those kind of things. So there's a multitude of ways that you can help and support the work that's going on. And so, again, part of the burden that God's given me is to make you aware of what we can do, even as individuals, as families, as a church, or whatever else. Uh, but, as we've said, the primary focus is on what's going on around the world uh, as far as our brothers and sisters in Christ and the persecution that they face. Uh, I'll talk a little bit more about this in just a few minutes, but uh, Open Doors USA, or Open Doors really the whole ministry, but Open Doors USA is the local branch. They put out every year, they put out a, what they call the World Watch List. And that World Watch List identifies the top 50 countries around the world uh, that are the most uh, involved in persecuting Christians. It can go from anything from extreme persecution to just making it difficult to witness or share the gospel. And, and 
I want to show you, these videos come from, actually, I think each one comes from a different ministry. I've got one from Voice of the Martyrs, one from Open Doors, and then another from the International Christian Concern that we're going to be showing you. But we want to start uh, by showing you the first two videos. Uh, and uh, there, uh, there is um, subtitles in English, uh, so if you have a hard time understanding them, and sometimes they're actually speaking in their native language, uh, but uh, there are subtitles so you can kind of follow along with what they're saying, okay? Uh, so we're going to start by meeting a gentleman by the name of Rohan, all right? Brother, go ahead, and just go ahead and do the next one right after it. Nan padahal itu wajah ayah rukum itu, anda beri noda kepada Yesaya naapati montru kundil. Nan uneh meet kunde, pesoli ada tetapi ni yang noda yang entah bahasa yang beri, dia uneh na alai cara anda kini anda orang uneh buli itu. Sehingga dulu kan, na panic. I knew the challenge. And yet I started the church. Nah, yelu bershow, na, anda personal evangelisme, children's ministry, itu mari dah senjut terus. Kalau mula mula, na, na, orang muka tu pergi na, pernah. Yesu itu dah. Adan pergi dah, rendah itu getel ha, anda yang datulah sabaya na, pernah, stop itu. This is in India, by the way. Adan pergi, orang kuripit, iru na, datulah. Friday after the evening prayer, eight p.m. Everybody left to go home. Around midnight, I got a call saying the church was on fire. Na, na, ina pun na na, ada pakum bodoh mana? I couldn't see anything. Full of tea, yang jitu semua. Everything was burning. 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 God gave and God took away. And now, 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 God gave and God Open Doors was able to help Rohan's congregation through prayer, encouragement, and funds to rebuild a new structure. Friday night, the same way God's heart longs for us to be the same way God's heart longs for us to be the same way God's heart longs for us to be the same way God's heart longs for us to be the same way God's heart longs for us to be the same way God's heart longs for us to be the same way God's heart longs for us to be the same way Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. Kurai bulan lebar gelar Yeramu, pura na rayum, nerei bulan lebar gelar rayum irukum badi, koru me yana de, pura ne kiri seyek kedawa de.
stand with your church family in India through prayer. Ask God to strengthen his church in the midst of persecution for his glory. In the primary school, we were taught that all missionaries were terrorists. They told us that a missionary will be nice to you at first, but when they get you into their homes, then they will kill you and eat your liver. There was no food and no work in my village. Like some others, I snuck across the mountain border into China. I picked mushrooms in the hopes of selling them in Chiang Mai. I don't speak Chinese at all. But in the mountains, I met a man. He said, I can sell those for you. And he didn't cheat me. He gave me all the money from the sale. At that time, I didn't know he was Pastor Han. Over the next two years, I went back several times. Each time, Pastor Han helped me. One day, I asked why he would do this for he himself was in great danger for assisting a North Korea. It is because I am a Christian, he said. That made me afraid. Was he going to eat my liver? One day, Pastor Han said to me, God is real. There is hope for every person. I could not believe he would say that word, God. Nobody says that word. We know it is an act of treason. To speak the name of God can lead to soldiers coming in the night. will write about you and no one will ever dare ask where you have gone. One day I asked Pastor Han for a Bible. He knew that if I was caught with a Bible, my life would be in danger. But over time, I persuaded him. I showed the Bible to my wife. At first, she refused to even look at it. Why would you bring that here, she cried. She knew that if anyone reported that you had even glanced at a Bible, you would be arrested, and not just you. You and all your relatives sent to the concentration camps for years and years and years. Over time, my wife too learned that God is real. She found hope. 
and then I share the word of God with my best friend. It was very dangerous for me to share. It was very dangerous for him to listen. One day in the summer of 2016, we heard that some North Korean assassins were being honored by the government, rewarded for their good work for killing a terrorist missionary in Changbai. We knew it was Pastor Han. Who else could it be? We, we were frightened. Did they know he was my friend? Did they know I had met with him many times? Pastor Han gave his life, but he gave hope to me and to many other North Koreans. And despite the ever-present danger, Many of us will continue to share the message that God is real. We hope that our sacrifice, when the day comes, will be worthwhile, just like it was for Pastor Han. Hebrews chapter number 13. Hebrews chapter number 13, we'll be reading verses 1 through 3. Let brotherly love continue. Be not forgetful to entertain strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unaware. Remember them that are in bonds, as bound with them, and them which suffer adversity, as being yourselves also in the body. Let's pray. Father, I ask that you just hide me behind Calvary. Allow me to share the things that you've given me. And Father, may I, I pray that the Holy Spirit of God would walk up and down the avenues of our hearts this morning. And Father, may we understand the reality, even though we may not be facing the level of persecution that we've seen in the videos and, and all of those kind of things. Father, help us to understand the reality that the persecution of our brothers and sisters in Christ around the world is very real. Father, I pray that you just use me to share the things that you've burdened my heart with, and we'll just give you the praise and the glory for all that you do. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. As the videos we've seen have already shown, Christian persecution is very real. And it's happening all over the world. Each year, Open Doors USA, as I said earlier, puts out a world watch list that presents the top 50 countries that are actively persecuting believers. The last video that we saw there was from North Korea, and North Korea has been number one on the world watch list for over a decade uh, with the kind of persecution that's going on there. Sadly, countries usually don't fall off of that top 50 list because they've actually improved conditions in that country so that religious freedom is better. What happens is, is that somebody ends up jumping up on the list because persecution in their country has gotten worse. As believers, we shouldn't be surprised at all when you think about this topic about persecution 
and it happening to saints. Now, in our country, we've kind of been in a unique bubble uh, for most of our country's history, and we've had the freedom of expression, the freedom of worship, the, the freedom to say what we want to say and do the things that we need to do as Christians. However, you can look around and you can kind of see those freedoms eroding just a little bit at a time. Only now are we beginning to see some of the telltale signs of persecution beginning to rise even here. But persecution is alive and well in far too many places in our world. Christ himself said in John 16 and verse 33, In the world ye shall have tribulation. But thank God he followed that up by saying, But be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. In the top 50 countries that I mentioned earlier, it's estimated that 11 believers die each day. And that doesn't include the other types of persecution, whether it's just being ostracized from a community. In India, where I had the opportunity to visit in the first video that we saw there, in India, in certain villages, if you become a Christian, and this is true of a lot of countries, but I know it happens in India. In India, if you become a Christian and somebody in that village finds out that you've, been, that you've come to Christ, oftentimes they will kick you out of the village and not allow you uh, to live there or take advantage of the well that's there or any of the things or even be part of a community. I know the same thing's true in Myanmar. I know the same thing's true in Sri Lanka. There are countries all over the world where that kind of thing happens on a regular basis. But not only that, we, see, we know of Christians who are being abused or beaten or being in prison. And like the one video said that we saw a few minutes ago, there is no trial. There is no news reports. And nobody, nobody wants to ask the question, I wonder what happened to so-and-so. The writer of Hebrews here in this passage who I firmly believe is the Apostle Paul and, and who spent many, many years in prison and being beaten and being persecuted for his faith. Here in, in Hebrews chapter number 13 and especially in verse number 3, the Holy Spirit of God gives the Apostle Paul here guidance for us as believers who may not be facing that level of persecution. And, and the truth is, even the thing that I find amazing when you study this, and I've done a lot of reading and, and, and communicating with pastors in, in countries where this happens and all of those kind of things, the thing that amazes me is that the people who are going through the deepest and the hardest persecution are the very first ones to pray the hardest for everybody else. As a matter of fact, I know of one pastor that I talked to, this was several years ago, Brother Ben Bounds brought him in and we had uh, breakfast together one morning and, and I was talking to him and, and he was actually from India and, and we were talking and he said that one of their greatest prayers was that the church in America would wake up and begin to pray more fervently for their brothers and sisters around the globe because the day's coming when the persecution is coming here. And that came from a pastor in India. So the writer of Hebrews here gives us direction on how we can support and pray for those who are being persecuted. Notice, first of all, that the Bible tells us here in verse number 3 that we're to remember those who are persecuted. The first thing that we see is that the word remembers, or the word remember here carries with it two ideas beyond simply the act of remembering itself. It's, first of all, a command. It's an expectation. It's something that the Apostle Paul and the Holy Spirit of God through Paul says that we need to do. So often it's, it's tempting to put things like the persecution of our brothers and sisters in Christ to kind of put it out of our minds because it's, it's hard to be reminded that people are suffering for simply being a Christian. Several years ago, Voice of the Martyrs, and they put out a free magazine that comes out basically monthly called Voice of the Martyrs magazine, but several years ago, they published a magazine with a young woman whose face had been terribly burned in an acid attack. Somebody came up to her for no other reason but that she was a Christian. 
and threw acid all over her, and the majority of it hit her face and her arms and her hands. She was terribly, terribly scarred and was terribly disfigured. But the picture on the cover of that magazine showed a young lady with a tremendous smile on her face. All because she was willing to suffer for Christ. The sad thing about it was is that in the next issue that came out, uh, the leader of Voice of the Martyrs at that time said that he had received a letter from someone here in America who had signed up because they were concerned about their brothers and sisters in Christ, and they had signed up for the magazine to kind of find out what was going on. And this evidently was the first magazine that she had received. And when she pulled it out of the, mag out of the mailbox, and she took a look at the picture that was on there, it so upset her that she contacted VOM and told them that they should never post such a picture on the cover again because it was too unsettling. And it was too hard to view. But folks, can I tell you something? We can't live in a bubble. We need to realize and remember those that are being persecuted for their faith. And we need to realize that it's a command that we do so. But we also need to understand that it's a privilege to have that opportunity. But then secondly, we see that the call to remember is not just a command. But the truth of the matter is, when you look at that word remember in the Greek, it actually, mean, it's, it, it actually makes the command very, very personal. Very much one-on-one. -on -one. Because if you translated it literally, it would be, remember yourself, those that are in bonds. It's definitely a call to the body of the church to remember. But it's more than that. It's more than having an IDOP Sunday once a year where you put videos up on the screen and a pastor gets up and preaches a message for just a few moments. And it's more than, uh, that, than, and than just, oh, you know, I get a magazine once a month. What this is is an expectation of each of us as believers as individuals to pray and remember those who are suffering for no other reason than they serve the same Jesus that we do. And that brings us to the two classes of believers that we see here. It says, remember those that are in bonds. And that means remember those who are imprisoned because of their faith. And then it says, remember those that are in adversity or who are suffering adversity, and those that's those that are suffering in any other number of ways. As a matter of fact, this is the latest Voice of the Martyrs magazine. It just came out. I got it this week, as a matter of fact. And on the cover here again, you can see somebody, and this is from Indonesia. This is somebody, if you'll remember a couple of years ago, there was a bombing on Easter in several churches in Indonesia. This is a survivor of the, one of the survivors of that bombing in that Christian church. And if you come up here, I'm going to lay it up here, you can see pictures of her face, you can see her arms. The skin that she has on her arms is so terribly burned and yet so terribly delicate that she cannot even hug her children. As a matter of fact, there's a picture in here, of an, another picture of her, and of her feet. The blast was so horrific and the fire was so terrible that it burned the images of the sandals she was wearing into the very skin of her feet. She'll bear that mark like a tattoo for the rest of her life. That's how real this is. That's how important it is that we need to remember ourselves to pray. From November, uh, November 1st of 2017 to October 31st of 2018. And so this is based on the numbers that World Watch List for the 2019 January uh, publication came out. But listen to this. Over 245 million Christians are living in places where they experience high levels of persecution. 245 million. 
4,305 Christians were ki- in that period of time were killed for their faith. 1,847 churches and other Christian buildings were attacked, most of which were burned to the ground. 3,150 believers were detained without trial, were arrested, sentenced, and imprisoned. And out of that 3,150, 2,625 of them came from the top 50 countries in that world watch list that I mentioned a moment ago. In seven of the countries in the, top, in the world watch list top 10, in seven of those countries, the primary cause of persecution is Islamic oppression, like Pakistan that we're going to see here in just a few moments. Eleven countries scored in the extreme level of persecution for Christians. And here's what you have to understand and why that should be such a frightening statistic to us. Eleven countries, five years ago, there was only one. And that was North Korea. In just five years, ten more countries have reached that level of persecution. And like I said earlier, for 18 consecutive years, North Korea has ranked number one as the world's most dangerous place to be a Christian. Surely, we need to remember those that are being persecuted, those that are in bonds, those that are suffering adversity. We need to do so in a way that it's personal, that it's something that becomes a part of who we are and not just a part of something that we do. But then secondly, we see that the Bible tells us to put ourselves in their place. Look at it. Remember them that are in bonds as bound with them. When we support the persecution of the church with an attitude of us you know, helping them, then our help isn't done in unity and that's not what God intends. Instead, we're called to remember them as if we were actually in their shoes. We're called to be in prayer for them as if we were chained alongside them. God knows that we, when we consider ourselves as one with the persecuted body of Christ, believers facing trials will be upheld, they'll be strengthened in all, in all that they need and in all of our prayers. But the question is, how do we do this? And oftentimes our schedules and, and our own problems sometimes seem to take up every minute of our day. And how can we pray for the persecuted, as Hebrews 13, 3 says? Well, Brother Andrew, who founded Open Doors, and he's got a tremendous book. It's his biography, autobiography, and it's called Tortured for Christ. I've read that one. I think Sabrina's read it too, or I know she's read it from his wife's account of it as well. But in, he says this, the stakes are high. If we truly want our prayers, our intercession for loved ones near and far to make a difference, then we must be willing to make the sacrifice. How important is this? What are you, what am I willing to do? We may, we may not be called to lay down our lives, but we're going to have to sacrifice. Are we willing to make the schedule changes necessary for intercessory prayer to be part of our daily routine? Are we willing to make the commitment to stay apprised of difficult situations around the world? Are we willing to accept the burden emotionally of bearing some of the suffering that our brothers and sisters around the world endure daily? And are we willing to persist in our prayers even when we don't see or aren't aware of God's answers? That's the, I started to say problem, but that's the reality of praying for our brothers and sisters in Christ around the world. A lot of times we don't know what happened. Occasionally we do. I don't know how many of you know the case of Asia Bibi in Pakistan that went on for years and years. It started when we were at Shepherd's Way. Miss Teresa remembers this. I know Sabrina and, and, and Josh and Aaron, all of them remember what I'm talking about here. She was imprisoned because she was working alongside or actually went to a well 
And some of the women knew that she claimed to be a Christian. And they accused her of insulting the prophet Muhammad. She had done nothing. But it didn't require anything else but somebody saying she did it. And she was imprisoned, I think, for eight years. Away from her family, her girls grew up. And every day she faced the potential of being killed at a moment's notice for her faith. When the trial finally came to pass, and this happened just in the last year, when her trial finally came to pass, she was acquitted and put immediately back in prison. Even though she was exonerated, even though there was no th no, nothing to the charges, they immediately put her back in prison. Why? Because they were afraid if she got out of prison, it would upset the community that she was in and other people would be hurt and die. So she spent six more months in prison as a free person. Finally, her family, her husband and her two daughters had gotten out of the country during the time of the trial because they were afraid regardless of how the trial went, they would be killed. And so Open Doors and VOM and the U.S. government and a lot of other people helped get them out of the country. But it was six months later before they could work it out and sneak her out of Pakistan to be with her family. That's one we know the results of. But every day, every day, every day, people disappear and we'll never know what happened this side of glory. It's hard because we don't see those tangible answers. It's hard sometimes to remember to pray. That's why it's so important to you know, get magazines like VOM or get on the websites of Voice of the Martyrs or Open Doors or ICC so you can see not only the needs, but occasionally there's a bright spot and you actually get to see an answer to a prayer. Without fail, every ministry that I'm aware of that works with the persecuted church, VOM, Open Doors, ICC, whatever, without fail, those ministries will tell you that the first thing when they talk to Christians who are being persecuted, they say, what do you need? And the first thing they always say, without fail, is we need people praying for us. But then we also see here in our passage that we're also to remember that we're a part of the same body. Look at it again. Remember them that are in bonds as bound with them and them which are also suffer, them which suffer adversity as being yourselves also in the body. Can I put it this way? And it's really, really simple. And I'll use a really crude example. When you, let's say, stub your toe, and there's not much that's more painful than that, especially when you, know, you just walk up on something and all of a sudden you do it. It really hurts right where you stubbed it. But you know as well as I do, every part of your body hurts when that happens. When you injure yourself, it doesn't, doesn't just hurt in that one little strip. You feel it. And that's because the head gets the message and the head then sends that signal out everywhere. You've been hurt. Can I tell you something? Can I tell you something? When somebody's persecuted, there's a signal that goes up to the head. The Lord Jesus Christ. And he sends out a signal and says, somebody's hurt. And you need to pray. And you need to help when and how you can. Because the truth of the matter is, we are all part of the body if we know Jesus as our Savior. When they suffer, we should feel it as well. And when we feel it, it will help drive our prayers as well. So how do we pray? What should we pray? Well, here are some recommendations from the Voice of the Martyrs. If you'll flip over to the other slide presentation, brother. Actually, let me back up. Sorry. Let's go to the video. This is from Pakistan. And then we'll go to that.
I am Ayub Masih, a Christian in Pakistan. This year my country was again ranked as one of the five most dangerous places in the world to be a Christian. But I don't need to see the report because I have seen the tears, the blood and suffering of my people. One day I asked God why my Christian families and their children are suffering. Why he did not do anything for them, for their liberty, for their dignity, for their rights, and even for their protection. And you know, God took me to Exodus chapter 3. Moses saw a bush burning in the wilderness. When Moses approached the bush, God said, Many apne logo ki jo misar mein hai muzallat dekhi. Aur unki faryaad جو عاملوں کے سبب سے ہے سنی اور چونکہ میں نے ان کے دکھ کو معلوم کیا میں اترا ہوں کہ انہیں مصریوں کے ہاتھ سے ان مائی پرسنل لائف ایکسپیرینس آئی ہیو نیور سین اے برننگ بش بٹ آئی ہیو سین دا برننگ چرچز برننگ ہومس اینڈ ایون پیپل بینگ روسٹیڈ فار دا کرسچن فیتھ ان پاکستان گوڈ ڈز سی and hear the suffering of my people and my brothers and sisters and God said I am sending you like Moses I questioned who am I I am just a Yub Masi and Pakistan is a dangerous place I care for my persecuted family because I am a servant of the most high and I believe God is with me pray for your Christian brothers and sisters who are serving the persecuted families and pray that you will be inspired by their courage and their faithfulness to be obedient to God's call and serve the hurting around you. All right, now let's go to the presentation. How do we pray? Like I said, this presentation is predominantly from Voice of the Martyrs, so I'm just going to step you through it, okay? First request of persecuted Christians is, as I said a moment ago, pray for us. Pray for Christians around the world who are imprisoned for their faith. Pray that God will strengthen, protect, and encourage them. Pray for God's protection of pastors and evangelists who share the gospel in restricted and Hostile nations. Pray for the provision and encouragement of Christians whose family members were killed for living out their faith in Christ. Pray that government officials in hostile and restricted nations will come to know Jesus Christ and follow His will for their lives. Pray for Christian converts from Islam who must decide when and how to tell family and friends they are now followers of Jesus. And the reason they make that comment is because almost invariably when that happens, if they have an opportunity, they'll kill them. It's considered an honor killing when that happens. Pray for radio, television, and internet ministries that broadcast God's word into restricted nations. Pray for the provision and safe delivery of Bibles to believers in hostile and restricted nations. Pray that persecuted Christians will boldly witness for Him even to their persecutors. Pray that Christians in free nations will choose to stand with our persecuted brothers and sisters. Pray that they'll sense God's presence, know we're praying for them, experience God's comfort, see God open doors to evangelism, boldly share the gospel, mature in their faith, be granted wisdom and covert ministry work, remain joyful amid suffering, forgive and love their persecuted, be rooted in, the, in God's word. And you have a handout in your bulletin, the yellow page that Miss Tammy put in there for us that has other ways to pray. Like I said, Voice of the Martyrs is probably one of the premier ministries out there that works with this. Their uh, web name is very, or web address is very simply persecution.com. 
Okay, dot com is Voice of the Martyrs. Persecution.org is ICC, and I'll show you them in just a second. Opendoorsusa.org is another way to find out all about what's going on. They're the ones who publish the World Watch List. You can download that for free off their website and see exactly what's going on around the world. They've got maps where you can highlight particular countries. Both VOM and Open Doors has, as a part of their ministries, ways to reach out and to help, whether it's to send in supplies, whether it's to even send blankets, whatever the need is. They have ways of getting into countries and Bibles and whatever they need to to help believers around the world. They actually have money that if a Christian is kicked out, uh, this happened in Pakistan, I can't remember the young lady's name, but she worked in a brick factory. And when they found out she was a Christian, she no longer had a job. And so Voice of the Martyrs or Open Doors 1 went in there, supplied her with enough funds to get her started in a small business so that she could make, and I can't remember if it was tablecloths or what it was, but it was some kind of cloth uh, thing. And she would make that and sell it, and that's how she supported her family. And they help with those kind of things. Then you've got persecution.org. That's International Christian Concern. Uh, it's predominantly where Voice of the Martyrs and Open Doors both kind of are, uh, they cover everything. ICC does as well, but they, I think their actual parent ministry is actually tied to the Catholic Church. But this is just a view of their website. That's why I pulled it up. And if you look at it, you can see it's very much like a news site like Fox News or any of the other news stations. You can get up there, and, and, and every day there will be different news reports. Sometimes there's videos. Sometimes it's just reading. But it will let you know what's going on in the country. It's more like a news site. And so it's an incredible resource to kind of keep up with what's going on. And then on top of that, and this has been a development in just the last few years, is the United States Commission on International Religious Freedom. This is actually a government, U.S. government website. And you can get on their website, you can sign up for their emails, and you can find out about things that are going on around the world, what people are being, what, what this commission is concerned about, what they're doing to try to alleviate persecution. And again, this, isn't, this one isn't specifically Christian. This is persecution of any religion. But it's predominantly because the Christianity is the number one persecuted religion in the world. There are more Christians dying for their faith today than there was in the height of the Roman persecution under Nero and Domitian and later on uh, with, uh, the, the, with, not the catacombs, but uh, uh, the, the Colosseum and all of those kind of things. There are more Christians killed for their faith both by number and percentage than there's ever been throughout history. And so all four of those are great ways to stay involved and to stay uh, in the loop on what's actually going on. So, that's what our brothers and sisters are facing. It's a tremendous burden, but they'll also tell you it's a tremendous privilege. If you get on there and you read the testimonials and you see other videos, and I could have chosen, if I'd have wanted to, I could literally have shown video after video after video after video and never said a word. So, Go out on the websites, take a look, you'll see what I'm talking about. But you'll see that not only does it break their heart, not only is it a very much concern, but at the same time, they consider it a privilege to suffer for the name of Christ. Surely, surely, we who have the opportunity and the blessing to sit on padded pews and put a cross in our yard or fly a Christian flag on the porch or uh, uh, put a Ten Commandments uh, thing out in the front yard or whatever, surely. Or post on Facebook, I love Jesus. How many people will share? Surely, in a country where we have that kind of freedom, we can take the time to pray for those who don't. They share our faith, but they don't share our freedom. So surely, we can pray for them. So what I'm going to ask you to do is let's gather around the altar. Everybody that can and will. I know some can't. But if you can, let's gather around.